It's time for AgriChat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things and the stuff about the things, and sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again. Time for another episode of Ragger Chat. This is episode 432. Tonight I'm joined, joined by Ashgar. Hello. Kodra. Hi. Tam. Hello. And Phelan. Peaches. Peaches, 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 peaches. Peaches, peaches, peaches. Move into the country. Millions of peaches. Peaches for me. <laughs> you know what? This is great. Now we're going to have uh, two points of references for that turn of phrase. It's true. And everyone will look like you like you're old. I, I am old. <laughs> I'm very old, Kodra. <laughs> I feel it uh, in my bones every day, Kodra. <laughs> Same here. Okay, so what is the other reference? Uh, Mario? Mario. Oh, okay. okay. Jack Black's amazing song. Okay. Okay. To be fair though, mine mine was also aligned with yours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Yes. Uh, Ash and I were on the same page. <laughs> Which is presidents of the United States of America. Yeah. Yeah. Weirdest were, hit song ever. Like they were put oh, yeah. there. In, yeah. They come in a can. They were put there in by a man. Nineties alternative was so freaking weird it really because it was. seemed like there was this period of time where anything could be a hit. Like one week. Or like what the the what was the song about the chimpanzees? Postcards, postcards with chimpanzees. Like, how how did this stuff? I'd have gone with one week, which is one of the weirdest songs ever. It's a very weird song. I, I mean, I would go with "Push the Little Daisies" by Ween. So, I don't know how really that became a hit a song. Song though. No, it was on the it was on the alternative charts. Yeah, like just all these songs that you'd hear and be like. Am I listening to the Dr. Demento show and I didn't realize it? Yeah. Like, I'm no. pretty sure Ween made it to, like, two or three on the alt charts with Push I, the Daisies. I mean, this is a bit more traditional, but, like, one of my favorite 90s songs start with I Would Swallow My Pride, I Would Choke on the Rhines, which is definitely a weird way, a weird energy to start a song off with. Eve 6 is amazing. The Eve 6 guy on twitter is incredible i was gonna say the eve six twitter account is well not like like good things on twitter the band though like i mean every album was good even though it wasn't popular yeah they were um yeah that was a weird aside (laughs) peaches um i i did i did get to watch the D &D movie since last week and i agree that it's very good so I need to find a time to catch that one. I have stuff I want to talk about with that movie, but I will withhold. Okay. That's when I feel like I probably should not take my five-year-old too. No, no you no. should. No, you <laughs> no. shouldn't. No. There's probably some stuff that will terrify. <laughs> yeah. Very faithful representations of, I mean, there are a lot of it's already in the trailers, but very faithful yeah. representations of some truly nightmarish stuff from D and D. I mean, the red wizards are heavily involved and, nothing they get up to is at all pleasant you know i had never really encountered like i had i've not that been that much into Faerun, obvious uh, honestly and yeah red wizards no the red wizards are the worst oh yeah, yeah. Oh, so. is basically the only D like setting i'm familiar with right probably. yeah like i mean I'm, I'm tangentially familiar with greyhawk but mostly Faerun. Yeah, I played a lot of Living City back uh, when that was active, and that was set in Faerun. So the the, the Red Wizards were one of the go to, uh, you know, we we need a villain for this mod for this adventure. Now, yeah, everyone terrible. Terrible. here's a Red Never, Wizard. <laughs> Neverwinter Nights Two includes Red Wizard as a, as a prestige class, only because they intended to use Red Wizards as bad guys. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, Dragonlance stands, but Faerun had all the best novels. It's true. I mean, that's really how I know the setting the most is through the novels. I mean, Baldur's Gate. <laughs> yeah, that'd be the other. Neverwinter Nights. Here. Well, that yeah. the old yeah. the, the old gold box games for me as well. Yep. Games by Black Isle slash Bioware. I I did not. I mean, I got through them a decent amount, but like, I never got into those games as much as I know other people did. Yeah, I think the gold box really is only a thing if you played during a certain period of time and were of appropriate age. Mm-hmm. 
Um, cause you know, like they were quickly eclipsed by lots of other things that oh, did absolutely. them better. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're not good games. <laughs> like they were, they were reasonably good. They were pretty good, um, computer representations of first edition D and D with all the flaws of first edition D and D. Yeah. They, they offered the ability to play D and D by yourself. Yeah. That. Yep. And at the time that was huge. Yep. It was also, uh, at one time, one of the most economical players' guides you could possibly buy. <laughs> yeah. I never thought about it that way, but that does make sense. The Baldur's Gate instruction manual was a full manual for both the computer game and a full player's handbook. Yeah. It like, is massive. Tiny spiral bound form. Yep. It was, it was legitimately years before I put two and two together and realized that all of the D&D books I had I had been sitting on a player's handbook for that long, and that would have connected all the dots for me. See, like I, I, I was a weirdo because I found a cop, a battered copy of AD and D in second grade, and for like the player's handbook, and forever that kind of dominated my my future. Yeah, I mean that was my introduction to it when I was. It was at a summer one one of those like you know summer like day camp sort of things educational things um and one of the kids at lunch had first ed D book and was running a game i wanted to play they let me be a monk i did not realize how broken and cool that was at the time monks were so overpowered first ed monks were silly but yes i hope they tell more stories uh with this cast of characters yes i like this cast of characters Oh, that's a definite plus over the previous D and D movies. Yeah, no, those were <laughs> horrible. I don't really remember any of the characters. No, like I genuinely like these characters. Like I don't think I actively disliked any of the characters in the previous D and D movies. I just don't remember who any of them are. There was the thief played by Owens. That's all I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's who who was in fact Owens. That's all I remember about the character. No, I, I really and the one bad guy with blue lips. Yes, I didn't even remember that. I don't know. Don't know why I had blue lips, um, but yeah. One one of the things that I did not realize watching this movie is most of the effects are practical effects. Oh, good. Which a lot of the people who I'm look like, oh, that looks like somebody in CG. No, that's somebody in a costume. <laughs> yeah, I I realized that for basically all of the animal people. <laughs> I'm I'm so glad that movies pulled back from the all CGI all the time. Because well, there's an era of movies that is nigh unwatchable yeah. <laughs> at this point. <laughs> I'm looking at you, first Power Rangers uh, <laughs> it, live action movie. Oof. All the CGI scenes in the Daredevil movie. Yeah. We were real proud of our ability to simulate reality. Oh, yeah. And what's weird, though, is like I can remember at the time not thinking any of that looked bad. Yeah. No, at the time, it was like, oh, it's so amazing. It's so cool. It's the Matrix. Now we look at it and we're like, this is some like original reboot slash Beast Wars level. Season yeah. No, <laughs> like it, look, it looks like that now. I don't know. I still think some of the Matrix, the Matrix looks pretty decent and holds up decently well. Most, at least the but, first one. Yeah. I think they actually used a decent bit of Matrix has a live shocking stuff in amount though, of too. practical effects in yeah. it. Like, there's definitely stuff that they used CGI for, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, I don't but think I, that they had, they hadn't reached that point of being able to just like CGI for everything. Yeah, but so the Matrix was a bunch of really innovative camera technology as well, so that they could get practical effects. Yeah, yeah, because because there was that for you know quite a while when once CGI started showing up, there was that kind of desire on the part of movie makers to pretend they were using more CGI than they were. Yeah. Uh, like that old movie, Flight of the Navigator, almost entirely. Like they, they really talked up that they used CGI for the, the ship in it and everything. It, yeah, only I've, watched a, I've watched a, a, a behind the scenes on that one. And yeah. it's, it's almost all practical. Yeah. Or matte painting. Or like it's a lot yeah. of matte painting. Yeah. They like had there's like two scenes where they actually did a CGI morph and it's just a couple of seconds. So 
I've talked a lot about Path of Exile, this this league. Um, the weirdest thing that has changed with this league is I have fully embraced the life as an NPC vendor. <laughs> and it's it's just so weird to me that like like no, I am not going to the level of you know trying to clock what I am doing in divs per hour, but also. <laughs> Like it's shocking to me how much stuff I've sold and how I've already reached the point where like last league I had a one chaos bin that I would throw stuff in and it is never worth me leaving doing whatever I'm doing for a single chaos orb. Mm -hmm. So like I, I'm not even putting much in my five chaos tab now, but like the vast majority of, of trades that I've made have been like 10 and 20 chaos with a handful of like outrageous trades. Um, even though the price of resonators was somewhat depressed this league as people were trying to farm uh, fractured fossils. Right. They still sell out instantly. Like I, I could have, you know, a couple hundred or several of the, the resonators and within seconds, someone will have cleaned me completely out. Yeah, anybody who's trying to craft a thing. It, it just shocks me how fast so all of that sells out. Part of that is that there is there's so much to do in this game. So many of these things reward their own specific reward. Right. And sometimes people want rewards that are not associated with the thing they want to do. The yep. trade league thrives on this. Yep. Like you do the thing you want to do, and you sell the stuff you don't need out of it, and you use that to buy the stuff. From other things right and like i got a regrading lens earlier and <laughs> it sold instantly I, just I sold so. instantly those uh, are cheaper this league than they have been apparently yeah i got a like i got a doriani's machination which is one of oh. the the good drops out of the val boss and i've seen more val bosses down in delve than i have in a while um it was just instantly gone and it was too div just it it's bizarre to me the crap that i can post um and it's just gone instantly and like mostly i'm relying on uh awakened poe trade which is a overlay that like lets me price check things so i mean i've gotten in this pattern of i do a content that i want and then i eyeball the items and if i think something might be valuable i price check it real quick um, but otherwise I just move on to the next thing I want. And it's, it's just shocking. Just the amount of crap that I, I generate, like between my two characters that are way more kitted out this league than they were last league. Um, I've probably spent about 10 divines, which is like a lot for me, but mm -hmm. like, it's not a lot for a lot of people. Um, it's a decent chunk, but I, I'm also already back up to like, 17 divines and a couple thousand chaos and it, it is it is bizarre to me how easy it has been to generate currency that i then turn into bad ideas you are embracing the trade lead life i am i am and i'm also starting to craft <laughs> i mean I, if you're going down into delve anyway yeah i mean like like that was part of it too is like i realized oh i have an abundance of the easiest crafting materials. <laughs> so like I made my own, uh, plus levels scepter and, um, I made a plus three bow for myself. What um, does plus three mean? So plus it, three means that it gives plus three levels to a particular type of gem. Right. Ah, uh, so a plus three bow is usually plus two to bow socketed bow gems. And, plus one to all gems, which combine to make it so that whatever attacks are in that bow are plus three levels. And then presumably this is a six link. Yeah, a six link. So six gems are are now, you know, plus three levels. So they're, you know, I'm rocking a, a, a 21 um, toxic rain in that bow. So it is technically a 24 toxic rain. Mm -hmm. And if I put some effort into getting a decent necklace, it could be a 25 
Toxic Rain. When you say put some effort, do you mean Ashes of the Stars or do you mean something more reasonable? Um, just a rare with plus all. Okay. Yeah, I think between like corruption and pluses on weapons and this and that and the other, it is possible to get a gem up to an effective level 28. Uh, you can do better than that. Yeah, you oh. can get to 30. Yeah. Oh my. You, it takes severe. You have to go to some lengths to get the right. values past like 25. But there are certain abilities like Toxic Rain that skill off, or scale off of gym levels mm-hmm. far more than they do DPS stats. Um, but like I've, I've crafted a plus two wand that I've got sitting in my bank for if I ever finish doing my Summon Raging Spirits character. <clears throat> I was going down the path of explosive Summon Raging Spirits since I found that helm that I decided I wanted to uh, try. Um, the other thing that I like I did recently is I went back and looked at my Sentinel and Calandra League characters. I saw your post on that. Because like I remember thinking like I I think of those builds as bad builds in my head. That's what I that's what I thought of them as. Is oh well they just weren't good builds. No no I just didn't know what the hell I was doing. On neither of those characters was I even vaguely close to re- resistance capped. I don't know how during Calandra I suffered my way through all 115 maps without yeah. being resist capped. And like even not just not being resist capped, but I was negative chaos capped. I, I don't know why I did that. I mean, clearly I misunderstood the importance of being resistance capped. I don't know that you did. I like, again, I just don't know that you knew how to get resistance capped. I, I think it was some of that. Um, also, like, I didn't understand what adequate defenses looked like. Mm-hmm. Like, I like because those characters also didn't really have any Land defense, right? Defense, exactly. No defense strategy. Like, <laughs> they had some energy shield and some armor and some evasion uh, and some block. I mean, you. Nothing in this game is going to tell you what you're supposed to do. No, no, no it's not. And it's only four leagues in that I feel like, oh, I understand how to fix these characters now. I mean, we we've, we don't need to belabor the point. This is why I get very frustrated with this game. Yeah, yeah, no. Like, it's not going to tell you. And, and there are so many defensive layers possible. Like, there's a thing called Ward that no one ever uses, but it is perfectly Incorrect. reasonable. Oh, there, Incorrect. There, are some, there are some really impressive things you can do with Ward. <laughs> But, like, it is not common. It is not common. It's not common. There's good reasons for it to not be common. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but, like, but like, there's all kinds of ways to get your life back other than regen. Yep. And they're all valid for whatever purpose that they use, so. Yeah. I mean, also, presumably, regen and potions, because, like, who uses potions for healing? Yeah. A lot of people. Lot Pathfinder. Of people. Pathfinder does. Yeah. That was that, that was the big takeaway I had about getting used to Pathfinder is Pathfinder wants to preemptively be hitting the heal potion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there are some builds that no, you you don't you don't even put a heal a healing potion on your belt because you have other more important things to do with your potions. There are some builds. A lot of life based builds you need to be healing pack time. one health potion just because that safety net is extremely useful. Just in I, case. The only reason why I still have a health potion on my righteous fire character That's is, different is to stop uh, bleeding. Yeah. It's the only reason why I have a healing flask. Yeah, tur- I thought you were going to say it's not burning. A potion oh, with no. turn off bleed is very important. Yeah, no, I don't have a quenching flask. I should maybe have one, but yeah. I mean, that's that's another thing that like they never really tell you about. You just kind of have to discover yourself is there are a whole bunch of status effects and you need to have ways to deal with all of these status effects yep. because they yep. will all kill you dead. Well, and like in theory, I'm still running Purity of Elements on Righteous Fire just because I don't want to put in the work to get status effect uh, immunity any other way. Because like it, it yes, I am grossly overcapped on resist right now, but also it's giving me the ability to not have to care about all of these status effects. The end game plan for my shadow still includes Purity of Elements because that way I don't have to worry about where I'm getting my resist from. Right. And also I can still be elemental effect immune. Well, like there's there's a bunch of ways to alternatively do this thing 
A sure. lot of it requires like storm shroud or something like that. That is giving you a, your, your one resist cap uh, applies to all other resist or not resist caps, but immunities applies to all the other yeah. immunities. I mean, I have a, an anti-corrupting blood, uh, you know, mastery point on my tree just cause I don't want to have to deal with that. But yeah, like there's, there's just a bunch of stuff that I have, I have learned the hard way now, but at the time I didn't realize I was learning those lessons. <laughs> I did run maps on, on all of those old characters just to see what they were like. And they were still mostly fine. It's just, I was having to ride my flask way more than I ever do now. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's been weird getting used to a trade league. Uh, when last epoch opens up their trade league, I will absolutely not be joining it. <laughs> I am not that bought into it. I mean, haven't you always been doing trade league though? Like that's the default league, right? Yeah, I've always done trade league because I've never turned or ticked the SSF box, but yeah. like for the first several characters, I didn't do any trading. Well, because SSF also means you can't get stuff from your guild. Right. Mates. Right. Yeah, you can't trade stuff at all. Because if it wasn't for that, I would I would have used SSF. Just I don't know. SSF would be really hard. It also doesn't give you any benefit. So. Right. Like that's the cool thing about the last epoch option is you're getting a benefit for, for going no trade. Yeah. I like that idea. Maybe, maybe find a way to, to, to some degree balance the game, both for ability to trade with other people. And if you're not able to other game that I've played, I, I mean, not like a ton of this week, but um, a decent amount is uh star Wars Jedi survivor. Yes. <laughs> the best Souls game has a sequel. I mean, like, if you play it with any kind of difficulty, sure, it feels like a Souls game, but if you turn down the difficulty, it feels like a really good Zelda game. <laughs> That's why it's the best Souls game. Because <laughs> <laughs> it has a difficulty setting. <laughs> and it has a smart difficulty setting. It It is... Like you could go you could go down a whole rabbit hole on just why Jedi Fallen Order and Jedi Survivor have a very, very well conceived uh, difficulty setting, like series of difficulty settings, because they only really changed four things. They change. And, and my guess is like they don't portray them this way, but having seen behind the scenes a little bit in game dev, like. The four things are your health, or sorry, your damage taken, your damage dealt, enemy aggressiveness, and parry window. Well, and I think the other key component of uh, these Jedi games is uh, time to reset from failed state. Because, like, when you have failed something, you, like, reset very close to wherever you failed. And that is huge, because, like, it allows them to do dumb jumps that don't feel awful when you have to keep trying to do the stupid jump. Well, it's actually really interesting They're So their platforming segments. So again, part of the reason that I think that it's a, I think that it does souls better than souls is because they understand platforming segments and their platforming segments have different rules for failure. If you get killed in combat, you're going back to a meditation point, the right. equivalent of a campfire. If you fall, you're reset to the last stable location you were at broadly, um, you know, Hollow Knight style, with some damage taken. As opposed to you fell to your death, you're back to a campfire. Also, good luck, you'll never get your body back. Uh, you, I will say, usually if you die from a fall, they put your body near the edge where you fell from yeah, in Souls games. Sometimes. I would say that that worked about... 50% of the time in Elden Ring. But yeah, it makes it makes the platforming a lot wilder. Like they can be a lot wilder with the platforming because like if you fall, it's not the end of the world. And you get to feel cool. Like part of it really is the it is a Souls game, but it wants you to feel powerful. Like you're supposed to feel cool playing it. And and like because you feel cool playing it, when you face something that's like genuinely tough, like a you know like an inquisitor, like a lightsaber wielding opponent, you're like, oh wow, that that person is scary because I know how strong I am. 
the the thing that this game in particular does that is so good is there is no amnesia metaphor. You, (laughs) You just start the next game with all the crap you had at the end of the previous game. You're not all out of practice and have to relearn all your abilities. Right. No, you don't, you don't have to go through a training montage. You, you just have all your stuff. Like imagine playing a Zelda game with all of the kit, the kit that Zelda collected from the previous one. I feel like the only game that ever did a good job with Metroid Fusion. Right? Yes. <laughs> is, it, is which game? Metroid, Metroid Fusion. Fusion. Uh, um, in which but you it's lose super Very, warped. very early into the game. Mm-hmm. And have to fight all your old abilities for the rest of the game. I was going to say, I, I I appreciated when Psychonauts did this and basically were like, we're going to have the tutorial mission where we sh- introduce you to all of your powers, but you have basically all of your powers from the previous game, except the ones we don't want you to have anymore because uh, we don't think they're part of the, they're a good part of this game. Like no, invisibility and shield. No setting people on fire with your mind here. Oh, uh, there were setting people on with on fire with your mind in Psychonauts 2. Was Power Kinesis still in Psychonauts 2? Oh, yeah. It's one of the the removed ones. Maybe I just didn't use it as often. Oh, no. (laughs) I didn't need to to set naked bears on fire all the time. Oh, yeah. So many things. It was crowd control. Fire is a viable form of crowd control in dungeons. It's true. (laughs) I don't remember Mind Trick in the first one. I don't remember that either. Like, I don't think that was a thing that we could do. That is something we have learned between the games. But, like, I mean... You start with all three lightsaber types, broadly. Um, well, you start with two, and then you get a third real quick, almost immediately. Yeah, they. by the time you're off of the tutorial segment, you have all three of your lightsabers, uh, like all three lightsaber configurations, so like single, dual lightsabers, double-bladed lightsaber. You've got force, pull, and push. You've got double jump. You've got mind trick which i think is new you, you can actually impact uh animals like that is a thing that you haven't had before but like it's cool that you can do it because that's always been a jedi thing but it's always been underrepresented other than like the animated show oh yeah oh the the force power lightsaber attacks you also start with all of those those used to be talents i i gotta say like the there's a specific tree for dual sabers that I'm going down and it is amazing. Yeah. I'm the, going down the, the thr- I'm going, saber. I'm going down the, the throw my sabers tree. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. Like it just, it just feels really good. And the, because they start you. So, in the first one, you had the single lightsaber for most of the game, and then later you got the double lightsaber. I don't think well, they ever gave you dual. Yeah, you, you you got the double lightsaber if you made the incorrect choice of going to Dathomir first. Yes. Yeah, you either got it very late in the game or very early if you did some dumb things. Although, like, I I stopped this afternoon. Like, I didn't, I didn't play it until this morning because I was too tired last night and wanted to approach it with a fresh mind. And I have gotten to the second planet, and I'm just going to say, that planet is miserable already. It is, floor is lava the planet, but it's not a lava planet. <laughs> like, I'm hoping eventually I get to a place where, like, it's not that bad, but no, nah, no, nah, it's just, like, I can't walk up a hill. I have to climb the walls when there's a perfectly good cliff in front or like a, like a perfectly good incline in front of me. Also there's sandworms apparently. Oh yeah. That's not good. You want that. But I mean, the first planet was amazing. Um, it feels very breath of Jedi at times more, it, more so than the previous game did. It's very open. Yeah. This one is like, way more open. Yeah. It feels, I don't know, it feels open without, it, it feels open without taking me over into I'm playing an Assassin's Creed map. Right. So, like, there's a bunch of exploration I can do, but it's not like, all right, here's 30 map markers for me to go turn to the other color. Well, and palette swap a whole bunch of maps, map, map notes. I don't know if this is 
something that continues on past the first planet, but like there's the ability to ride mounts, but it mostly feels like an ability to skip boring sections of the planet. I approve of that. I mean, that seems great, actually. Like one of the one of the things that did. So one of the improvements from the first game is that they start you with some really key force powers early. I'm looking at you force pull um, because there's a few segments where like precisely hitting a hanging rope could be really annoying until you got force pull. And it was just like, no, that rope is yeah. here now. And now you just have that. And that's a big improvement. Um, and the first game also had, I remember being annoyed in some places where I had to like backtrack through a bunch of annoying stuff just to get to where I was trying to go. And I feel like that having something that lets me do that more cleanly would be really nice. Fast traveling between meditation points is also nice. Yeah. It's like um, the, the Dark Souls 2 versus Dark Souls 1. Yes. Well, and and honestly, like the planet is better messaged. Like yes. there were, or, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm going to run into another Kashyyyk. But like Kashyyyk had a bunch of tunnels and platforms that were largely interchangeable that I didn't know exactly where I was at any given time. Yeah. So far, all of the terrain is sufficiently unique to keep me from feeling like I am just in another one of these corridors that looks exactly the same. I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see. um, I'm waiting to see some of the later, more complicated planets. But thus far, they've taken the best map I've seen in a video game and made it better. Like the previous map was very good for navigating the complex spaces that you were in. Yeah, there still has not been a game that had put in a better 3D map, as far as I know. Yeah, and and this map is, it's like they took that map and they're like, what if we made this map more readable and let you do things like put your own markers down? Several, in case you care so much. My, my, only, my only knock against this game is there's some tutorial characters involved that are so painfully obviously tutorial characters yeah i mean look i got a knock against this game i returned this game on steam (laughs) um i i picked up this game i tried to get it to work for about an hour and a half i couldn't get it to work like i could get it to be just barely playable uh yeah see i haven't had issues but i've heard of issues that everyone's been having yeah um I like it was really, it was pretty smooth at 1440p for me. Yeah, like I need to be really clear. My computer is a Ryzen 7 5800X with 128 gigabytes of RAM and a 3070 graphics card. Yeah. There are not I should not have performance I shouldn't have per, the performance issues I was getting in this game. And like nothing I did made it better. Yeah. Um, I I've not run into that, but I've seen examples of people posting. Um, I mean, and, and like the, the main difference between our systems is I've got a 3080 and you've got a 3070. So yeah. I don't know if that's, what's making the difference, but whatever okay. the case, like I've, I have heard like lots of people that have beefy systems are just struggling with this game. And I returned it. I got my credit. I got my, my, credit card charge back or not charge back, but I got the credit <laughs> back turned around and bought it on PS five and it runs like a dream on the PS five. It looks as good and it runs better. And it runs like not just better, but it runs fantastically. Whereas on my PC, I, I compared it to star citizen where star citizen ran better and that's not okay. Now, like the only time I ever experienced any kind of sluggishness was there's a section of the first planet where there's just a bajillion particles everywhere and the particles will kill you. Yeah. And like there were a couple of corridors that had just a lot of those particles in it where like there was a little bit of sluggishness, but, but mostly not. Yeah. The, so there's a section, there's a, there's a cut scene early on, like relatively early on right after the tutorial planet where uh 
the where Cal looks at something out a window and goes, what is that? And I assume that there was a camera cut to whatever he was looking at, but it wasn't until I played it on the PS5 that I got to see it. Yeah. It just hung. I could hear the audio. And when it caught up, I was looking at something else. It was like, it was, it was bad in a way that I, I'm very not used to PC games being bad for the last like half a decade. And like, I don't know. I, I guess maybe it's time for me to upgrade my PC. But it shouldn't be. But it sh- yeah, it should. Yeah, be. that some something something in that PC code is badly badly optimized. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it makes it's me been wonder. Been a running if, theme for reviews as well. So I mean, it makes me I wonder if, if if this is one of those games where it was right down to the wire and they didn't optimize the PC client. I mean. They, at some level, at some level, the PC client for a lot of games is a pittance for the hardcore. Mm-hmm. And at some point, it's like I, I can I could see somebody being like, "We're just not going to bother. We're not going to bother for anybody with less than a 3080." That that seems really bad, though. There's a lot of PC players that don't have that kind of hardware. Yeah, well, I just, there's a lot of PC players that don't have that hardware, but are they the kind of PC players who are going to buy a, who are going to buy Jedi Survivor? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, most of my Steam friends list seem to be trying to play it, so. Yeah, I mean, I I really wanted to play it on the PC because it's sort of where I can more conveniently play games than the living room, but. Yeah, like, I don't even know if this would be functional on a Steam Deck. I have no idea. I mean, Elden Ring is, is my understanding. Yeah, but... There's several I mean, patches, right? I, I, I'm I sorry, but <laughs> Elden Ring looks kind of ugly as compared to Jedi Survivor. It's fair. I mean, in fairness, Elden Ring has some of the worst graphics optimization in the business because From Software has some of the worst graphics optimization in the business. On the other hand, I actually imagine they would probably have been more likely to test Jedi Survivor on a Steam Deck than on a bunch of different PC configurations. Because at least a Steam Deck like is a known quantity. Yeah, I mean, it's the iPhone of uh, PCs. So they might have actually done that and have like an optimized settings for it. And it could be an NVIDIA drivers thing. And, and mm-hmm. we'll see a, a release over the next week and that'll fix things too. Who knows? I mean, I'm thankful I'm not running into much issue in that department. So yeah, I mean, it was, I played the original on PS five. I'll play this one. I'm just switching over and playing this one on PS five, but it was a, it was an unpleasant surprise to be like, wow, this game, this game runs terribly on my computer. Yeah. See, like I was always going to pick it up on PC just because like the last time, It has the warning saying you should really play with this with the controller. And at first I was like, okay, I'll believe you. And then when I I returned to the game after bouncing from it, I gave them my finger and played it with a mouse and keyboard and it was a much better experience. So I am so happy that I can still play with a mouse and keyboard and it still feels good. Yeah, I'm, I'm playing on a controller and it more or less works fine for me. My only complaint is that I wish I could change my keybinds. You're kind of stuck with, with the PC keybinds, from what I can tell. What? Yeah. That's like almost maybe, worse than the performance problem. Like, like you can change some of them, but you can't change all of them. And there's one specific button that I want to change, the dodge button. because like That's, I, that's I, the I, most I, important button to be I, able to I change. have standardized on a specific uh, setup for dodging, and I do it in guild wars 2 i do it in you know new world i i have a specific button that i dodge on now i would i would prefer to do that uh in this game as well but instead i have to hit tab what tab is a dodge key it's weird no no i think that's worse than the performance problems (laughs) yeah i mean i play plenty of pc games that i play on a controller because they won't let me invert my mouse (laughs) like dear Dear game manufacturer developers, just let us set our controls. 
yeah, you, whatever I you mean, want them to be. I'm fine if it's just a text file that I have to edit. I don't yeah. care. I, That's fine. I'm less fine with that, but it's better than not being able to change them. Yeah, that would right. at least be something. Like you, you give me whatever defaults you want, but let give me a way to change them. Right. I mean, it, it kind of feels like they're like, well, we told you not to play with a mouse and keyboard, so instead you're <laughs> gonna now get you know the controls that Jerry and accounting thought were good. <laughs> like this is your punishment for not listening to exactly. us. Exactly. Sorry. We'll show you. How far into it are you, Tam? Uh, not very. Okay. Um, I have probably an aggregate of three and a half hours played, but that involves restarting from scratch. Okay. I basically finished the first real planet, the the first non-tutorial planet, or at least as much as you can, uh without having abilities to come back later for and have gone to the second planet but got frustrated and had to take a break. I also checked the star charts just to make sure I didn't accidentally go to Dathomir. (laughs) (laughs) Is that also an option? No, no, there's no split planet option this time that I could tell. I think they may have decided that was a questionable decision. I mean, at least they warned you that it was a questionable decision. Oh yeah, I mean they messaged that's a bad idea. Yeah, but but like why why let your players do such a bad idea? Exactly. Because sometimes you want to make a game for a certain kind of person to hurt them. Does that mean we're moving to talking around Halon Fungus now? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Let's do that. Hey, it's a certain kind of game. It I... is definitely a certain kind of it's actually really fun, but it's definitely a certain kind of game at times. Uh, so I found out about Lone Fungus because Fireborn did a video about new Metroidvanias that were coming out this year and like one that was getting kickstarted right at this point, which is Rune Fencer Ilya, which looks pretty sweet. But he mentioned as an aside, hey, also Lone, this game called Lone Fungus came out earlier this year and it was great. And I was like, oh, OK, let me check it out. And it's great. Um It definitely starts from the premise of, did you like the way Hollow Knight let you use your sword for mobility? Because that's going to be the focus of this game. We're going to give you a slash, and the first room you get that slash in, we're going to teach you, these are spikes. If you swing your sword down at the spikes, you get a pogo. And I've been playing through this game, and it feels like the best sort of combination of like hollow Knight's pogo mechanics, the messengers like midair slashes for uh, additional mobility mechanics. And then Celeste just absolute frantic speed. There are definitely rooms where I'm like, it's, it's got that twitch element of the, the type of my favorite type of Celeste screens. Despite my earlier joke, this, this game is really, really fun. It is very fun. It looks terrifying. Hey, you know, uh, it's got it's got a setting that I love. It's got a bunch of difficulty settings that let you tweak individual things, and I love it. Ooh, yes, nice. that part is also great. Um, if you open the map, there's a toggle. Yes. It's you cool. can either have it work like Hollow Knight or not do that. Yep. It can work like Metroid or it can work like Hollow Knight. Take your pick. Oh, I did not realize. Is that what shrine mode means? Yes. yes. I should turn off shrine mode. If it's on shrine mode, your map updates when you stop at a shrine. If it's not, it's like map- continuous or something. It it's yeah, it that makes sense. Updates as you explore. It's great. Neat. It it I definitely it. encourages a lot of exploration and experimentation. You can do I'm not even gonna say things the designers didn't expect, because they clearly expected some of these things. But like, yeah, it's got sequence break potential. When you put okay, look. When you put spikes in the floor below the point where their hitbox will hit you with a small <laughs> enough gap that you can just walk over them, your developers have thought of things. Oh, yeah. like That was definitely the room where they're like, we want to tutorialize. because, And this is, this is kind of like a weird thing. I didn't realize you could pogo off of spikes in Hollow Knight until I got to Path of Pain. Like, I legitimately had no idea that that was a feature I had available to me. And then, it like, you go back and it changes the entire way you play that game. 
And I really appreciate that they're like very early on. We're going to tutorialize this. And then like they drop you an ability to like put a a thing that you can do spike jumps off of in midair. And it feels <laughs> it feels very much like old school Metroidvania or Metroid uh, bomb tech. Yes, it does feel a lot like that. You know what you're doing with bombs in Metroid, you can fly. This one, the designers did not anticipate in any way, but it, in this game, it, it, they knew what they were doing. They knew exactly what this was going to be used for. And then periodically, you'll find a door that has stars on it, and it takes you to a astral shard room in which like, they're going to take away a lot of your tools and be like, all right, now it's time for you to go very fast and do a bunch of precise things. This is all optional, but if you want to, it's here for you. I have no idea what astral shards give you. Uh, the, I have found. I've run a, into the door. I have found a mirror. Yes, I've, I've seen have, the big mirror. Okay, you've seen the big mirror. That's that's the extent I've seen. I don't know. I'm it does tell do, me that there are way more of them than I expected. Oh, there are so many of them. I did find one hidden behind a like a false wall that you can sword your way down, and I was like, oh, I need to. I need to recontextualize what walls I think are breakable and which ones aren't. They also have helpful guides who are like there to tell you, hey, I think you have all of the tools you need to get past this obstacle sometimes. Or, hey, I don't think you have all of the tools you need to get past this obstacle. Sometimes those are wrong is what I've discovered, but at least they're trying to guide you in certain directions if they don't think it's going to work out well for you. This is definitely a game I'm really looking forward to, like, routing. I mean, wrong in the sense that usually they underestimate your capabilities. Oh, oh, yes. Overestimating, which is much, much better. Yes, no, no, no. They're always going to, like, they're always going to underestimate you. They're they're always going to, like, make sure that you have the things that they view as, like, the minimal requirements to get through. I am curious if there are any sword upgrades, because I haven't found any yet. But I should also take my lessons in Hollow Knight and start using spells more is the other thing I've learned. Yeah, the Bouncing Spore is a good spell. Yeah. Plus a mobility tool, because of course it is. Of course it is. I'm really excited for... I'm really excited for this crop of, like, Metroidvanias, like... This is a really cool game. This is a really fun uh, continuation on the ideas from Hollow Knight and a bunch of other ones. I think it's uh, in some ways a blessing that Silk Song is taking as long as it is. <laughs> Creates some oxygen in the room for other people to try stuff. So who, what's the over-under on Xbox having lied to us? I've been thinking they've been lying since they said it, but we're coming darn close to June, aren't we? I don't actually know this reference. Oh, they uh, said all the games will be out within a year, and the six one was most recently shown last year. So Xbox did a thing where they showed a bunch of games coming out within a year's time, and they included Hollow Knight Silk Song on it. And like, of course, because the community that is behind Silk Song, everyone's like, "Wait, does this mean we actually have a, a hard release date for Silk Song now?" The answer ah, is no. no. I, I don't believe it. Also, since I don't think we've gotten a hard release date from Team Cherry or, like, any update recently, uh, I I have doubts. Yeah, but keep in mind, again, they dropped Hollow Knight onto the Switch. Just did Shadow drop Hollow Knight on the Switch when they did that. I mean, I, I feel like they would need to be starting some sort of a PR engine for it. I mean, it could just appear. They know they've got fans. Word of mouth will happen. I don't know. I would think the various consoles they're working with would want to have a PR campaign. You mean Microsoft? Yes. Microsoft seems to like to shadow drop things. Yeah. Especially since they mostly want people to just subscribe to their service. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Speaking of their service, maybe they'll shadow drop their acquisition of Activision. I was going to say, they might oh, be man. not Correct. buying Activision now. Makes me sad because, like, part of me was still holding out hope that maybe I would be able to care about blizzard games again but i i yeah no i i don't know i i think i i think this is continuing to run into obstacles it sounds like this is a pretty big one yeah Yeah. i mean it is a gigantic acquisition yes the well i mean a big obstacle (laughs) yeah 
That too, yes. The reporting from... Weird, weird to say this. The reporting from Loading Ready Run <laughs> really kind of opened my eyes to like, yeah, actually, the issue is not Call of Duty. It's we think you're building a monopoly in this with Xbox Live or Could Game Pass. Be. We think I Game mean, Pass is a is a like monopoly. To be fair, like they're the only ones doing it right. But there's still the, they're the only one part of that statement. I mean, Sony has their thing, but it sucks compared to it. I mean, the, it still, it still fascinates me that nobody's come after Steam. I mean, Epic tried. E- Epic tried. And, I mean, and, the most, and most recently in that, you know, a lot of people, I, I don't know how many people have actively gotten rid of their Epic accounts after, you know, Tim McSweeney said stupid things, but it doesn't you help. Know, you know, well, that's a good point. I think this is one of the, like, Steam is not, like, trying to do mergers and acquisitions or, like, maybe it's just hard to pin them down on, like, unfair business practices. I mean, but this are- came up during the Apple lawsuit. Like, success is not does not mean you have a, you are being anti-competitive. Yeah. Like, Steam's mostly just over there doing their own thing, it's, as far as anybody can tell. But the reality, however, is that being the largest market means you get to stay the largest market. Because that's uh-huh. how it works. Yep. Once you've got a lot of people bought in, you know, there's a lot of inertia in your favor. They're definitely not the only market. Like, it definitely exists. GOG definitely exists. A little more than that, honestly. <laughs> and they mostly aren't trying to, like, crush GOG or crush Itch or buy them out and merge and acquire them. Well, I feel like those... Those aren't as much of a direct competitor to Steam. Like Itch is like it, what, God what, is whether, I want old games and Itch is I want really indie games. I want indie games, yeah. Like whereas Epic is very much directly like trying to be this is where you get the latest and greatest games. That's Game Pass. I and, and yeah. <clears throat> and, yeah, I think as long as as long as Itch and Gog are, you know, happy to just have their little niche that they currently have, like Looking back at the history, like probably possibly the most anti-competitive practice Steam ever did was making it part of purchasing the orange box. Yes, I was going to say Half Life Two. Yeah, which you, yeah, yeah require, requiring Steam to be able to activate your copies of the orange box and Half Life Two, I, like that made I mean, a lot of people you, mad. You need the Epic yeah, Game at, Store to at play the Fortnite. time. Yeah, at the time, people were real pissed about that. It's it's almost like. The first time a thing gets done, people get real pissed about it, and then they get used to it. Horse armor. God, I saw one of those, like, domino memes with the small domino being horse armor and the big domino. I have to pay 60 bucks a month to unlock airbags in my car. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. That one might have gotten a little out of control. Maybe a little bit. I just have to admit, I still haven't really interacted with Game Pass. Yeah, I haven't either. I don't have the latest Xbox, and yeah, I, I don't have the latest Xbox, and I know I can get it on my PC, but I have subscribed to it like a month at a time for specific games before. Yeah, I mostly use it to play whatever Microsoft games are out instead of buying them. Yeah, and like I just don't. I realize that I just don't have. There are more games that come out that. I don't have time to play generally. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. That, <sighs> that like. And that's why I'm playing Final Fantasy IV. <laughs> yeah, I don't need a subscription. <laughs> like I don't. I don't. There isn't space in my life for a subscription for whatever games I want. I mean, I guess ask me in five to seven years. I, I was gonna I say. Uh, I feel like if. If this was instead of a Microsoft Game Pass and was instead a Nintendo Game Pass, I think I would have already bought it. Oh, I'd be all over that. To most, and it would mostly be my son using it. Yes, exactly. So I mean, I, I already, I, I already shell out the extra for the Game Boy Advance and the Nintendo sixty four and all that, and he gets a lot of use out of those. So yeah, I guess I, I definitely understand it. And then, like in six years. When the problem is, there's not a lot of games geared towards his age that are coming mm-hmm. out on the Xbox Game Pass. Yeah. yeah, I mean, probably the best use case for it is if you have 
a circle of friends that are Xbox users. If everyone has Game Pass, you can just play anything that comes out the day it comes out. And like, there's like a, there's going to be a lot of people that aren't necessarily in that specific niche, but they, they do exist. Um, and like for them, that's, it's a phenomenal deal. I, I do have that group of friends, but uh, I don't think they're interested in paying $60 a month for NHL 2K, which does seem to be the only game they play. <laughs> I don't think it's like 60 bucks a month. I don't remember how much it is. It's cheaper than that. It Considerably cheaper than that. Oh, oh, like basically the old price. Blah. It was originally the old price of Xbox Live Gold, but it's moved up to MMO price, 15 bucks a month. Yeah, yeah. Or 9 bucks a month, 10 bucks a month if you only play on console. Right. Yeah, the 15 bucks a month is the both plan, I think. I guess that's fair, yeah, because I don't have an Xbox console anymore, so I have no reason to go for that one. Right, that was also a thing I went for it for while I was playing at PSO2 on the Xbox before that came out on PC. Because pretty much every month they were giving away free stuff for uh, PSO. It makes me think I should really cancel my PS Plus subscription because I can't think of the last time I used it for anything. Yeah, I think I I let mine lapse when my the last time I had to update my credit card info. At some point, I need to reinstall Last of Us and see if that ever got optimized on the PC. You know, I started playing that game and it was too sad for me to play. And then and now I think that if I tried to pick it up, it would hurt me in a different way. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Yep. I hear it's a very good game. It's a great series. They just made a very well-respected HBO series about it. I'm sorry, a Max series about it. Max. But yeah, no. Uh, I I think I would have an issue with it now. Yeah, definitely. Same. What is Everspace 2? Everspace 2 is a space exploration RPG. It is the sequel to a game that is not that. Everspace 1 was a roguelike. It apparently had a story. Um, I didn't play enough of it to see it. But I saw this at... I'm going to tell you that I saw this at PAX, which will give you some sort of timeline as to when that was. <laughs> but this, they decided, decided, instead of making a second roguelike, to make just an adventure campaign RPG thing. That is just this very arcadey space game. It's a lot of fun. So when you say explore, like space exploration RPG, are you like... Do you have a class... Or talent trees and levels, or what What does that mean? You do have levels. Your character has, like, I mean, the big form of progression is ships and weapons. Mm-hmm. Your character has levels. Your char- uh, You play as a set character whose name is Adam, who is definitely a clone from the first game, even though, whatever, in the time between the first game and the second game, cloning has been made illegal. But he's got a backstory that you are slowly filled in on, although, again, as mentioned, the backstory is the first game. And you sort of you meet a variety of characters. You can get a bunch of ships that do various different things of way more variety than I would expect. Although it's got a bit of the risk of rain problem. And that it takes a bit too long in the starting ship before you can get to any of the others. Do all of the ships play very differently like risk of rain? or Pretty much, yeah. There are three ship classes, like light, medium, and heavy. And even between the, each of those has three different types of ships. Like the heavy class, which is quickly becoming my favorite, has the gunship, which has four weapon hard points instead of two. So it has twice the fire rate as basically everything else, Mm -hmm. along with a bunch of heavy armor. Not very fast, but whatever. You're fine. You have guns. Uh, The Vindicator, which I think is another heavy ship, is a drone commander ship. You can make drones from wreckage, and they can do a bunch of your fighting for you. Okay. I'm interested. And also also in the heavy class is the bomber. So instead of having... It lets you use energy for missiles rather than having a stock of missiles. So you basically have unlimited missiles, unlimited mines, whatever, secondary weapons, just with an energy bar. Uh, this is my favorite chip class so far. But light ones involve, like, the Scout, which I have tried. It's not for me. Uh, it's the, I would like to survive combat by making it happen very far away from where I am. Ah, a ship class after my own art. Yes. It's got damage bonuses based on distance to the target. It's very fast. All the lightships are very fast. Some of them just want to be closer to the enemies than others. And like one asks you to be a backstabber. One gives you better device cooldowns. So it's more like a ship version of a weird mage. 
Ah, this sounds like a ship after my own heart. <laughs> Maybe I've been playing a lot of Mech Warrior lately. <laughs> you start the game with EMP. EMP is very good. But yeah, I've been enjoying this so far. I don't think I'm that far into it, despite being several hours into it. I'm on the second star system, and I don't know how many there are in total. I'm starting is to it, meet some non-humans. Is, is it pretty much entirely taking place like you are piloting a oh, ship? Oh, it's entirely on the ship, yes. Okay, cool. So there's, it's not like go to the ground or go to the ship. It's all ship all the time. Correct. Now, is it always in outer space, or are you like descent-style flying your ship through dungeons? It's always... So there's never gravity, but there's definitely been some interiors I've had to fly through. Got it. Even if you're on a planet, there's not really any noticeable gravity. The game does not care very much which way is up. Yeah, that was also true in Descent. But, like, I I distinctly remember, like, having to explore a cave system. And I was like, this is awesome. Yeah, it's been so long since I played Descent. <laughs> like, I love my... This is like This is like me in racing games. I want my racing games to either be super arcadey or, like pornographically detailed. Yeah, and I've never been much for the simulationist style space games. Like, the Star Citizen's the Elite Dangerous. It's not my thing, really. This very much is. It almost sounds like Star Control. I've seen a lot of people comparing it to Freelancer. I was gonna say, Star Control is more top-down. Yeah. Like, arena combat. But it was very arcadey. I mean, the first thing I go to when I think arcadey is Wing Commander. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Freelancer, I mean, Freelancer is descendant of wing commander and yeah. freelancer is one of my favorite games of all time i somehow basically entirely missed freelancer it came out at a time where i did not have a gaming capable pc it's really easy to miss freelancer like it came out at a weird time in general but i'd like the star wars games that came out like prior to this and that's sort of where i got my start on i like space games like rogue squadron yeah basically yeah Rogue Squadron. Or even yes. older, like, games like X-Wing. Like TIE yes. Fighter. See, X-Wing and TIE Fighter are up there. They're, like, they're closer to the simulationist feel to me. It's still great. X-Wing kind of is, because they very, very large emphasis on how your weapons are set up and things like that. Yeah. But the actual flying, I didn't feel like so much. I never have to worry about how I'm going to land in this game. I get close enough and hit the button. <laughs> yeah, I have this game loaded up on my hard drive and haven't had time to play it. But I'm very much looking forward to having some time to play it. I'm going to have to pick it up. It sounds fun. But there's a lot of games coming out lately. This is this feels like they're the month of games coming out. I think it's fascinating that games now come out all year, especially in the late spring, early summer, mm -hmm. as opposed to everything coming out in November. I got to get it in time for Christmas. I mean, I feel like there are two things behind this. One is just a decreased emphasis on holiday spending because people don't always have the most money at holiday times, actually. Maybe wow. put out games, people have more money. And the yeah. other reason is uh, 3 is less important now. Well, but I also feel like a, a huge chunk of it, too, is that physical uh, game sales are not near what they were oh, yeah. once were. Yeah, that's, shelf, like, that's a big part space, as well. Yes. Shelf space doesn't matter. Because every, everybody would stock up for the holidays, mm -hmm. and the holidays were a big vid or time for game buying in general. Um, but now, like people just that's buy fair, whatever yeah. comes out, take advantage when people are already in stores buying gifts. Yep. I mean, there was a time when Nintendo consoles always released at the holidays, and now, yep. like the Switch released, I think during the summer, didn't it? Switch released in like March. Yeah. Okay. Very much not a holiday console anymore. There are at least three Nintendo consoles that released in late September. I mean, that kind of counts as holiday. I guess that's fair. Yeah, yeah. that's that's the ramp up to the it's holiday. Up to it. Yeah, because at this point, Thanksgiving starts in like August. <sighs> the Thanksgiving sales. In, I think the Nintendo 64 was very much like an October-ish, maybe? The Nintendo 64 right. was September 30th. Okay. I know this because September 30th is my birthday. And ah. so I, <laughs> I distinctly remember consoles that released on my birthday. I also know I also share a birthday with the NES. I think the Wii released in November ish. Sounds right. I know there's a big thing. I know I didn't get one the... until like February, I think. 
I didn't get one until the following year, yeah. But there yeah. was a big thing on the dome for it. The thing with the Nintendo was it didn't become popular until a year after it had already been on the market. Mm-hmm. Wait, do you mean the NES? The NES, yeah. 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 Sorry, <laughs> I am of sufficient age that when I say the Nintendo, I mean the NES. That's, that's the original. The first one. The gray box. Yeah, because like I became, I didn't even really become aware of the Nintendo until I want to say eighty, maybe not until eighty seven, which would have been two years after it came out. And then I get, I actually got one the following year. I was not aware of many things in eighty seven. Christmas eighty seven is when I got mine, <clears throat> and then we lost power uh, on Christmas morning, and it was out for three days. <laughs> oh man. I got one for my. I was in birthday. agony. <laughs> I, Actually, I guess I, I guess it must have been '87 that I got it because it was the it was the deluxe set. It was the one that had Rob, and I don't think that existed anymore by '88. I got a secondhand Nintendo in '93, and I was so excited. My first Nintendo console was the Wii. <laughs> yeah, Bell and I are old. Yep, we know. I I I remember like saving all of my money in anticipation for the Super Nintendo, so I got it relatively shortly after it released. Yeah. <clears throat> like, thanks to Nintendo Power, it had been selling me on the wonders of the Super Nintendo. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nintendo Power, that it it did its job. Oh. Boy, did it do its job. Like, there was no way I was going to miss that one. I the first console I saved my own money for was the N64, and I did a lot of refereeing for the, soccer refereeing for that console. Uh, 64 was a college thing. I think for me, the first one that I bought entirely on my, my own would have been a PS1. The Sega Genesis. So here's the thing: I played a lot of Genesis, I played a lot of Super Nintendo, but my friends had them and I didn't. <laughs> the first console I bought for myself was my PS3. The PS1 and 2 I got for Christmas. I uh, had been saving, had been saving every little bit of allowance, every bit of uh, like whatever thing I could do to make a little bit of money for the Sega Genesis. Uh, And my mom decided, or no, for a Super Nintendo. And my mom picked one up for my birthday. And so I was both very excited, but because I hadn't told anybody I was saving this money for it, I was like, well, what do I do now? And I just sat on it until the Sega Genesis came out. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll try this. Cool. And then I was that friend. <laughs> I, I, I was that friend also, but much later. Um, there was a weird outlet mall um, that, you know, got blown away in a tornado at one point. Um, but they had like a, I don't even know what the toy store was called, but they sold refurb Genesis, like, I don't know, much cheaper. So like, I think they were like 60 to 80 bucks for a refurb Genesis. So I ended up picking up one of those so I could play the games that I wasn't able to play on the Super Nintendo. Mickey's Castle of Illusion was the, the big one that hooked me on the Genesis. I was going to say, as, the, as one of the few people who had both, uh, let me put the age-old argument to bed. The Super Nintendo was better. Yeah. Across the board, <laughs> yes. Unless you wanted fast action. Yeah, if you wanted... The the exceptions I will make, certain fighting games were better on the Genesis. Oh, they were just worlds better. Even Mortal though they Kombat. looked like, like crap, they were better. Yeah, Mortal Kombat was not better on the Genesis because Mortal Kombat was not fast. Yeah, it was... It was clunky. <laughs> yeah. Mortal Kombat 2 was, was smoother on the Genesis, but it looked so ugly. Which one? Mortal Kombat 2. It, yeah. it, was, it was smoother on the Genesis, but like it looked awful. Um, but like, especially shoot 'em ups and things like that were just better on the Genesis. Um, like, even Gradius 3 had so much slowdown. I mean, they each excelled at a type of game, but. Most of them were better on the Super Nintendo. Mm-hmm. But like I think the challenge of the Genesis and the Turbo Graphics as well is they came out so far ahead of the Super Nintendo 
that they had basically locked in place the hardware and it was effectively a generation behind the Super Nintendo. Yeah, because the Genesis came at, I mean, it was two years earlier than the Super Nintendo. That's, that, and that, that's a big difference technologically at that point. Like, I almost feel like Sega put all of their like attempts at better graphics and smoother gameplay into the Game Gear and got trounced by a black and white system that had Tetris and reasonable battery life. It did have Tetris, though. The Game Gear and- is also... Uh... We never really got the Master System over here. Not really. I mean, we did, but no one had them. Like, I had a friend in my class that had a Master System. I didn't know anyone with one. And I I didn't know they existed until I got to, like, high school. Yeah, I I honestly didn't know. I have never encountered a Master System. I did not know they existed until I started, like, researching the history of video games. Like, it was (laughs) a pretty good console. Like, it really was. It just had no representation. But a lot of Game Gear games are old Master System games. Yeah. yeah. Like, um, the Zillion games were amazing on the Master System. And, you know, I had the little dongle that would let me play them on Game Gear. Because, um, like, I have a Master System, but I never used it. I just used the adapter on the Game Gear. Or, honestly, the best Master System system is a Genesis Type 1 with the Master Gear adapter. The Master System was a predecessor to the Genesis, right? Yes, it was. Yes. Yeah, it, it came, came out, out the same day as the as the Famicom. Right. Like, it, it was a competitor to the Famicom, and um, it had cartridge games, but it also had these weird little SD card-looking games, too, that were pretty basic. Um, yeah, it had a card slot. <laughs> it, it didn't have any, like... In other regions, it did, but in the North American region, it didn't have much in the way of third-party support. So, like, the only things that were coming out on it were things that Sega itself was making. Or, like, some Atar- ports from Atari. Right. Down ports from Genesis games. Yeah. It's infamously a Master System version of Sonic 2. <laughs> it is not good. I was just thinking, that's, that's the one that I played a lot of, and it wasn't good. I played it on Game Gear, where it's even worse. That's what I where I played it as well. And yep. The small screen size did not do that game any favors, unfortunately. I didn't learn until, again, like high school, why I thought this game was uncompletable. This was a common opinion. I mean, I feel like the best Sonic handheld game is the one on the Neo Geo Pocket Color. I think Sonic Chaos is fairly good, because it's the one they did not try to port a game. They just tried to make a game for that console. Neo Geo Pocket Color is also a handheld system that was underappreciated. It was crazy expensive. It was super expensive, but it was really freaking good. And but like it was it, crazy expensive. <laughs> yeah. Its key problem, though, in the long run, was the fact that it was yet another system that decided backlit screens weren't a good idea. So it had a reflective thing, so you had to do the the same crap you did with a, a, a Game Boy and have some kind of light pointing at it. Mm-hmm. I thought they had a light on that one. No, no. I mean, they might have. Maybe they eventually released a version that did have a backlight. Maybe, but the yeah, the one I have has got a reflective screen behind the screen, so that if you're in sunlight, it'll light it up. But yeah, no, it was mm-hmm. nope. Yeah, my 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 son has discovered this. all the times where you didn't want to play games. Yes, exactly. Because I've I've got. I've got a Game Boy Color and I've got a Game Boy Pocket. And he decided he wanted to try using the Game Boy Pocket. And I was like, I can't see this. Well, that was our life. I'm sorry. It's true. You can't. He he really he really wants uh, Super Mario Land One to come out on the Nintendo on no, the Switch Online. No, he so doesn't. He can, so well, so that he can play it and actually see what he's doing. And yeah, no, no, no he terrible. doesn't. It's a terrible game. And like, <laughs> I mean, I I have a copy of it. He's played it on the Game Boy. He's gotten i mean a reasonable we way thought it was it. cool at the time but now he knows the game so boy i games never are... thought it was cool it... because i'd play his golden coins first yeah oh gosh yeah 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 no 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 early game There's boy no games were were real bad yeah no original the yeah super mario land is terrible awful game at the time i loved castlevania adventure <laughs> it's a bad game it's a it's a universally bad game 
One of my favorite early Game Boy games was Batman. <laughs> and like, it's barely recognizable that it's Batman, mm-hmm. but it was fun. I loved having the Batarang shield that would that would circle you and and you know basically it was righteous fire for Batman. Mm-hmm. I I do appreciate how um, like there were some there were a few really good games like uh, the Zelda game Link's Awakening was great. Yes, yeah, Link's but that was like great. that was like at the end of the console generation. Yeah, that was, much was later it? on. Yes. I, mean, I thought that was like, somewhat contemporaneous with like Link's uh, A Link to the Past. It came out after A Link to the Past. Way, like, way after. Way, way after? after? Link's okay. Awa- yeah, Link's Awakening came out in 93. Well, wait, so when did the Game Boy come out? 89. Okay, so when you say the end of the Game Boy, when did Pokemon Red come out? 98, 97 in Japan. Yeah, so yeah. wait a second. That came out for the Game Boy, right? By that time, the Game Boy Color was around. Yeah. And we but, actually had good Game Boy games. <laughs> but it came out for the Game Boy. Yes. The Game Boy lasted a long time. We're not saying all Game Boy games were, were, were garbage. No, no, no. Early Game Boy games were garbage. Sure, early. I'm just, I like, in my mind, when you say, like, oh, it came out in 93, that still feels like the beginning of the Game Boy because, like, the it's, game I most associate with the Game Boy was... Pokemon, yeah. Red. No, 93 <laughs> was like right in the middle of the Game Boy's lifespan, basically. I mean, longer than that if you count the Game Boy Ad- Advance, which you can still play the original Game yeah, Boy Yeah, I mean, games. I think, so, like the Game Boy Advance, that was 2001, wasn't there? No, Game Boy Color. There was a Game Boy, there was like a semi-Game Boy generation in between Game Boys. Yeah. The, yes, but that was just... Mm-hmm to play Game Boy games, but with color. Yeah, but it but it extended the life of the Game Boy like yes. generation a lot. It did, particularly because ga- games that were made with it in mind could have an actual color palette, as well, opposed to just layering a palette on top of an existing black and white game. I would say the Super Game Boy was probably what started that. Mm, and the Game yeah. Boy Color was just a way to play games like you could on a Super Game Boy. Yeah, initially. But then when games started coming out meant for the Game Boy Color, like you could have, you know, Pokemon games where things were actually the appropriate colors. But yeah, so the the last Game Boy game released was released in 2001. So the system the system survived over a decade. Is it the longest the longest supported console of all time? It might be. 12 years is a long time for a console. How long did the PS2 last? That's the one that I think would compete. Looks like the last PS2 games were 2014. So that lasted 14 years? Yeah, I think it actually, I think PS2 win, wins. Yep, 14 years, PS2 wins. Anyway, we have long since gone over our, our normal Oops. time. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, any final thoughts? Um, We've talked about Midara. If you... Thought Madara sounded interesting. They are selling their full catalog of games on their like backer kit, so you can now purchase Madara again. Neat. So I think the up- over up all upshot of our entire nice discussion is Tetris is such an amazing game. It sold the Game Boy entirely on its own merits. Yep, that's it clearly it. Really. That was all it had. Just Tetris. Isn't there a movie about this? There is a movie about Tetris. I don't think it's out. I think it's coming out soon, but it actually looks out. really good. I think it's out. Is it out? But it's, okay. it's Apple TV exclusive, so I haven't seen it. Yeah, I guess that's, yeah, that's part of it. I mean, there was there was also the, the you know, comedy movie where Tetronimo's fell from the sky. Yeah, we don't talk about that. <laughs> we don't talk about that. Why would you talk about that, bro? <laughs> anyway, hopefully you enjoyed the show, and we will see you again next week. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you.